going to say it. I said good morning, everybody. I guess Vera is everybody, but I get one and a half now. <laughs> so, but we're really happy to have you all here this week. Uh, you know, uh, scripture that keeps coming to my mind as I think about how long church right now is that we're two or three or that we get to remind me that Jesus is the best. And I, I really, really uh, appreciate the faithfulness and the commitment that I see in the ones that are coming today. Uh, I think it's great. Uh, and I think of the wonderful Savior we have. Uh, there's been a lot of things that I've heard recently that uh, if I had hair on the top of my head, it would be standing straight up. Uh, really, really, uh, I get upset. I get angry at uh, different people and some of the things that they have said. And we're living in a world today. This this past week, ever since the Charlottesville situation, uh, we're living where we need to really, really identify what uh, is going on. Uh, our, our nation has become as, almost as polarized in the extremes that you found before the days of the Civil War. Uh, we, we need to uh, really, really come to grips with the need for the truth of the gospel to be spread. Uh, Ruth showed me last, last night and uh, I think after she showed it to me, she was looking for permission to put it, to share it on her Facebook. A video of a preacher. And evidently his congregation is biracial. And boy, he was really going to town about what happened in Charlottesville. Charlottesville. And uh, I looked at Ruth after I, I listened to it. I said, Ruth, I agree with everything the preacher was saying. I said, I wish I would have said it. I think back of my life and some of the things that I've heard. Uh, when I when I first got married, uh, somebody introduced me to the John Birch Society. How many of you remember that? John Birch Society. And the information that he provided for me to read, uh, I kind of liked it. And so uh, I began to investigate further the John Birch Society. And when I came across his or their position on the racial issues, I immediately dropped it because I would have nothing to do with it. Uh, when I was in Tarsville, I had an opportunity going down to the Eastern Penn Temple of West Virginia. And I had a trial sermon, and boy, I, I, the trial sermon went well, the interview was going great. And, uh, I had people pat me on the shoulder and said, you're going to be our preacher, you're going to be our preacher. And, uh, it was, uh, I was getting kind of excited because it was a big church. And uh, as I was going through the interview and talking questions, uh, I asked them about their missionary program. And uh, they were spending close to $30,000 a year on helping a black church. And I made the mistake by asking, where is this black church that you're helping? Oh, right across the street. And I said, well, how many do they have coming? Boy, well, they said, oh, about two dozen people. And I said, why don't you bring the black preacher over and have a co-ministry and join churches? That way you won't have to pay for the double the electricity, double the gas, double the uh, other expenses. Oh, we can't do that. The black and the white have to be made separate. And so I told them, forget about my application. I went back to Tadisville. And that, another time, uh, I was preaching in Corbin, Kentucky. That was one of the most prejudiced towns I think I've ever seen. They, after the Second World War, they drove all blacks out of the town. 
I mean, literally broke them up. Took them by a gunpoint down to the railway station and shipped them off wherever they wanted to go. In the hospital, they had a black nurse. I've been trying, trying to remember her name. I can't do it. But she was a surgical nurse. And she came in one Sunday morning early to be able to help perform the emergency surgery. And after they got out of surgery, she was going to go back to Barberville, Barberville, not Barbersville, in order to be able to uh, uh, go to church. And she realized she didn't have time to go to church. And she was a Baptist. And she Driving by one of the churches, she thought, well, I'm just going to go to church here. So she stopped the car and found a parking place and went into the church. And the minister came up to her and asked her to leave because they don't want blacks in their church. I had heard about it. I knew her, knew her well enough. I could do what I was going to do. I walked over to her after I heard about her and I saw her. Put my arms around her shoulder and I said, I heard what happened last Sunday morning. I said, if you're ever in Corbin, Kentucky, and look, look for a church to attend because you can't get back to your church, you're welcome to come to where I'm preaching. She looked at me, you can see the hurt in her eyes. And she made a comment, she said, how do I know I'd be welcome? And I told her, I said, because we have blacks coming now. She said, where are they coming from? And I said, well, my daughter Ruth is a counselor at the residential section over here for the alcohol and uh, drug abuse program. And she goes over there and she, with her car, she loads up her car with anybody who wants to come to church and raise in the church. There are black people, the people that she brings. I said, they would have been asked to sing in our bar, they would have been asked to play on a ball team. I said, we don't make any difference people you white and black or we preach. And she said, well, I'll remember that because I will come. Now, I've got to tell you something about, about her. We got to the point where we talked about race. It, 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 every time I see her, she would tell me something. She says, what color are you seeing? I said, I see nothing but the, the blood red of Christ. Why, why? And she would laugh. But while she was there, she she got pregnant by her husband and had a baby. So I walked into the hospital room to see her after I looked at the baby and I saw how beautiful the baby was. I looked at her and said, her name was Hattie. Hattie, I said, I don't want to tell you that I'm tickled pink or tickled pain. She looked at me, shook the finger and said, in this case, you better be tickled pain. Her husband was standing right there and he says, this is the preacher I'm telling you about. I reached over and shook his hand. We had a good talk. My Bible tells me in Acts the 17th chapter that God made all people of one blood. And when you consider the fact that the blood runs in our veins is exactly the same no matter what race we are. I asked a person one time that was highly prejudiced. I said, if you were laying on your deathbed and you needed blood, and the only person ready to give me blood was black, then would you take it? He said, well, sure, I take all of it. But uh, sometimes I think we get out of it. We need to realize that Jesus came into this world for the blacks, for the oriental, for the Indian, as well as for the white. And we need to realize that there is a unity through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that brings us into one body, his body, the church. I, I, I just had to say that uh, I'm, I'm, I get upset with people, not with the theories of philosophies. But Jesus is presented in the Bible as being universal. He's a wonderful Savior for all. And there are many great and wonderful passages that we can read 
this morning that deal with the person of Jesus Christ. And deal with them. We would read in John the very first chapter, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with Him. All things were created by Him and for Him. And without Him nothing was made that was made. We, we read in uh, Philippians, the second chapter, that, that Jesus being in the form of God, that are not robbery to be with God, but made himself in no reputation, took upon himself the form of the servant, and was made in the likeness of man. We, we read the passage that I read for our communion service that identifies Jesus Christ as being the, having the preeminence because of the fact that he is a son of God. And over and over and over again, we see glimpses of the person and the work of Jesus Christ being exempl uh, exemplified by Scripture. But the one I chose this morning to talk about is Hebrews, the first chapter. We need to realize that the book of Hebrews is, uh, is written to a bunch of Jewish people that have become Christians. Because of the persecution that was brought in place by the hands of the Jews, as well as some of the other uh, agencies or uh, organizations or philosophies that were out there, they were on the verge of slipping back into the ways of Judaism. Uh, I, I, every time I read the, read the book of Hebrews, I wonder how the people with once and grace, always and grace, come up with uh, some of the things they do. But the writer of the book of Hebrews, which I personally believe was, was the Apostle Paul, and because he was writing to Jews, he was writing in different language styles than what he, uh, than he would have. He was writing to Gentiles and the Greeks. He says, God who has done good times and a divers man is making to us by the, uh, through, through the prophets. God was one of the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Now I want you to listen to what the Bible says about what the book of Hebrews says about Jesus. Whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his word, glory, and the expressed image of his person, and by upholding all things by the word of his grace, when he hath by himself urged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having, having become a, so much better than the angels as he was has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Boy, what a passage of scripture. Four things that I see here, and each one will begin with the word that hurt them again. Four things that I think are important as we there I'm, I'm sorry for taking the rest of much time but my spouting off as I did. But first of all we see that the person of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ is seen by his works, words. Uh, God spoke by him in these last days. Uh, he doesn't speak by Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon. He doesn't speak by uh, uh, Brigham Young or any of these other, uh, Charles Russell or any of these others. It is by Jesus Christ that God speaks to us. He does not need a, a pope to be able to make edicts to be able to dictate the church. Excuse me if I offend anybody, but I have to just say it the way I feel. But God spoke by him. If you read the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, after we receive the beauty that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, down in the 10th verse, I believe it is, in the 14th chapter, there Jesus said, The words that I speak are the Father's words. I'm speaking the words of God, the words of my Father. Never a person spoke as he spoke. He was a master teacher. I don't know about you, but I would have loved to be in a crowd, sitting down at the feet of Jesus Christ and listen to him spout, uh, teach some of the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. He opened up doors of knowledge that were not even thought of before. But all in agreement with what the Old Testament said. He revealed heavenly truths. He was eloquent in his teachings. 
The scribes were sent up by the, uh, by the temple priest or high priest in order to be able to find fault in Jesus Christ. He spoke up and said, never a man spoke like this man. He gave us an example by his teaching of how we should live and what we should do. That we should follow his steps. We think of his words that will endure forever. Libraries are full of books with explanations of his teaching, art and music and poetry. One of my favorite books in my library is called uh, Christ in the Fine Arts, where it takes the various poems and everything that was written. And the Bible goes through the life of Jesus Christ uh, and has it in. Uh, it's a beautiful book for quite a uh, pleasure of reading. Wow, every book after book. Paul John himself, the books of the world could not contain the whole things of the life of Jesus. What about his works? God made the worlds by him and for him. I, I, I realized that, uh, that he would have done good in his life. Uh, he did everything that uh, good for people. Uh, he healed the sick. He caused the blind to see and the deaf to hear. He gave cast out demons that were in the people. Sometimes I wonder what's going on in the world today if we're not seeing demons in people today. His miracles confirmed his identity. He was God. The resurrection proved his glory and wonderfulness. That he was the Son of God. His worth. He was heir of all things. He owns the cows on a thousand hills. Yet he was sold for 230 pieces of silver. But his worth exceeds that in great number. He's all the world to me and you. Christ must mean all to us, there means nothing. Good, wonderful God. We are joint heirs with Christ. I cannot imagine what glories are in store for the Christian as he passes from this life to the next. And then his wounds. His wounds. When he had by himself purged our sins. Let's, let's remember when Jesus was on the cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't know whether Jesus felt that way. Or whether the significance of the darkness the, uh, that invaded the earth at that particular time. That God actually had his turn, his face away from Jesus. I heard a preacher one time, when I'm not sure if it's right or wrong, but I didn't make that particular judgment, make the statement that when all the sin of the world was placed upon Jesus, God could not look upon the suffering of his son. Not because of the physical punishment, not because of, of the agony he was going through, the, uh, the loneliness of everybody forsaking him, but because he was suffering spiritually, separated from Jesus, but from his Father in heaven. Nail prints in his hands, wounds on his side, lashes on his back, thorns on his head, undeserved. Yet he unselfishly gave himself. His words must be a foundation of our faith. His work must be the assurance of our faith. His worth must be the basis of our blessings. His wounds, the source of our salvation. Jesus is all the world to me. My wife, my love, my love. Is he your Savior? Is he your 
Why we forsake him? If not, we're going to be seeing one verse of all those percent. We ask that you come. That you might be buried with Christ in baptism. Will you come?